Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Dan from On One. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar. I'm really excited to talk to you about On One Photo Raw 2018.1, our new release that just came out yesterday. Now, before we get into the demo, let me hit a couple important topics for you. First off, today's session is being recorded, so you can always watch it again later. You can slow down if I go too fast through areas. The other thing to keep in mind is if you have questions, you can use the Q&A module that's built into the Zoom window, or if you're watching via Facebook, you can also make comments on Facebook, and we'll catch those as well. Now, for using a live streaming technology, sometimes the audio and the video might not be in a perfect sync. Hopefully they will be. If you have any problems or you can't hear me or the video drops out, it's probably an internet connection issue. Just try signing out and signing back in, and usually that'll get things going. All right, Nathan, am I forgetting anything before we get going? Nope, that's everything, Dan. If you have any questions, feel free to ask questions, and I'll be able to help uh, reload, relay those to Dan for you. Cool. All right. Everybody see my screen? Nathan, everybody got my screen? Yep, I got you. All right, perfect. All right, well, let's get started. So first off, there's a question you guys might have, and that is, what are we looking at? So this is On One Photo Raw 2018.1. This is a free update to On One Photo Raw 2018. Anybody who has it can get it right now. Just go up to your help menu and select Check for Updates, and that'll download this new version. Now, this is a really feature-packed version. It's more than just a small maintenance release. We've added a ton of cool features in it since we shipped uh, 2018 in November. So I'm going to go over some of these features for you now, and after each feature, we'll take a little break, and we'll be able to answer some questions on them. So let's get going. The first thing I want to show you is the new import dialog. When it comes to getting the pictures off your camera or off your phone into your computer, that can be a bit of a challenge. And in the past, we kind of relied on users doing that on their own. And one of the most requested features that people have asked for is the ability to help them get their photos off of their other devices onto their computer. That's what the new import dialog does. It's located up here under the file menu and import. Now, when I select that, it's going to pop up and it's going to automatically show any memory card that I've attached to my computer via card reader, like in this case, if I have a PTP device, that would be a camera or a smartphone attached, it'll pop up automatically. I also have the ability to manually select any location I want to. So let's say I've got an external drive, it's got hundreds or thousands of photos on it, I want to move it from point A to point B, it'll help you do that as well. Now, one thing I do want to mention, because this can be confusing to folks, is when we say import, think in your mind download. What we're really doing is we're helping you move photos from point A to point B, or copy photos from point A to point B. All One Photo Raw is still at its heart a fast browser. It browses the photos without having to import them into a database. So I don't want importing from a memory card and importing from a database to be confused. They're two different tasks. So you can still simply browse your photos just like you always have. You don't have to go through this import dialog to get your photos. All right. In the middle, you'll see thumbnails of all the photos that are on the device. So in this case, I've got a memory card. It's got 220 photos in it. And by default, it's going to select all of them automatically. Now, I can use the thumbnail slider at the bottom to make those thumbnails bigger or smaller if I want to. And I can turn photos off. So let's say I've plugged in my phone and I've already downloaded a bunch of the photos on it or you're using a compact camera. Maybe you don't download every photo every time. This lets you pick which photos you want. So you can just hit the little checkbox in the corner to turn photos off. To make that even faster, you can just use the arrow keys on your keyboard. And as you arrow through those photos, if you hit the space bar, it'll turn those photos off. And if you want to turn all of them off, there's a check none option. And if you want to turn them all on, use check all. That's the easiest way to do it. All right, now, so once I've picked the photos that I want, over here on the right in the destination pane, let me move this little window out of the way. Over in the destination pane, you pick where those photos are going to go. This is the one thing you have to do because our job is to move photos. You have to pick where those photos are going to go. So it will automatically remember your most frequent places, the places you've downloaded photos to most recently. It'll also remember any catalog folders. So if you've created a catalog folder, think about that as a watched folder. We keep an eye on that folder automatically. If you put these photos into that folder, then they're going to get cataloged and we'll know about them instantly. Or it'll go to the current browse location. Or what I'm going to do is you can pick any location you want. So I'm just going to use the choose option and I'm just going to put these on my desktop. There we go. Now, there's an option to add a folder. You can put it into a folder. This is where you'd put in a folder for like a job name. So rather than having to create a new folder in advance, you can create it on the fly. So I'm just going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call it Bella. That's her name. And then there's some additional options when I roll down this little more section. I can choose a backup location. This lets me download to two places at one time. That way it'll back up your photos. There's also an organize option. By default, it's going to put everything into the same folder. 
but you can also go to the organized combo box and you can have it organized by month or by day. So if you're downloading from a device like a cam, like a uh, smartphone, for example, it'll create folders for the year and folders for the month, and if you want, even folders for the day, if that's the way you choose to organize your photos. All right, at its most basic, that's all you have to do. You pick the photos you wanna download, you pick where they wanna go, and you hit the import button, and now it'll start to copy those photos from the memory card to your computer. But there's a lot more cool stuff you can do in the import dialog, and this is where the real value comes in. You can rename those photos on the fly as well. So if I roll down the rename pane, I'll turn it on, you can go through and rename those photos. So I'm going to rename these. I'm going to give it a job name. So I'm gonna call these Bella. And you can then add more pieces to that name. I'm going to add a date option. So we'll pick date. This will use the capture date from the file and put it as part of the name. And I happen to like the year, month, day option. So it's gonna do Bella, then the year, month, day that it's shot, and then I'm gonna add a serial number to the end of it. We have to have a number to automatically increment. So I'll add a serial number right here, and I'll put uh, 001. So there we go. It'll, when it downloads those, it'll batch rename them for me automatically. There's also the ability to add metadata to these photos on the fly as well. So if I turn on the metadata pane and I roll this down here, maybe make it a little smaller so it's not so intimidating, I can put in common tags like my author and copyright information and keywords and descriptions if I wanted to. So let's say I'm gonna put in my tag here, I'll put in my name, and these are Copyright Bliss Studio, and I could add some keywords for the entire shoot. So we know this is Bella, and she's a senior, and she's class of 2017, basic information like that. If I need to add more, I can roll down the more option here I have the ability to add a description to all of those photos. I can also automatically set the star and color rating for all of them. I know some photographers will actually change that color rating to mark the photos that haven't been edited yet. They'll say, all of my photos I haven't edited are purple, for example. So you can set all of them to purple by default. And then you can also add all of your IPTC metadata as well. So your contact information, information about copyright, use status, all of that information can be added in here. You can even use a metadata preset. We'll get to those here in a minute, but from the preset pop-up, you can select any metadata presets you've created and apply them on the fly too. So a really handy way to add the metadata. You also have the ability to add a photo setting on the fly. This is great if you happen to shoot at the same venue all the time. Let's say you're a sports photographer and you shoot in the same gym or the same Coliseum all the time, and you know what white balance setting it needs to have. You can create a preset in advance that have that white balance setting set and then every photo will come in with that white balance setting applied to it. It's really handy. Now, I'm just gonna make these all black and white so it's really obvious that something's gonna happen. So we'll turn photo settings on, I'm gonna roll it down. You have access to all your presets. I'm just gonna grab one from the black and white category. I'll just grab Automagic, there we go. And you also have the ability to edit the capture date. Now, if you're like me and you travel to shoot, oftentimes you forget to change the date in time in the camera from where you were shooting at home. So if here on the West Coast, I go to the East Coast and I forget to change that, when I come back and I download those photos, the time's gonna be off by three hours on all of my photos. This lets me compensate for that right when I download them. So I'm gonna say adjust for time zone and I'm gonna use a minus three option. There we go. That will now adjust the time zone for me automatically. Now, once I got everything all set in here, I just hit the import button right down here. But before I do that, I'm gonna mention that I could save everything in here as an import preset right here from the import preset pop-up. So you can create your own settings that remember everything in here. Oops, let's hit import. Now, it's gonna to start to import those photos. It's gonna automatically go to that location and you'll see the photos come in. You'll notice the settings getting applied on all of them. You'll see progress right down here in the bottom right-hand corner. You can see how many photos it's downloaded and how many remain. And if I have multiple import jobs running, I could even select which job I wanna watch the progress for. All right, we're gonna let that download here for a second. While it's doing that, let's see if we have any questions out there that I can answer. Uh, not, not so far yet, Dan. <laughs> Everyone's I, I really quiet. Too fast there. <laughs> Everybody's really quiet. They don't have any, they don't really want to uh, ask any questions apparently. Say, okay. Dan, since you're waiting for that to download, what mm -hmm. if, uh, if you click the more button at the bottom of uh, the Zoom panel, can you uh, stream this to Facebook? Mm, that is a good question. I have no idea. Hang on, let me stop sharing for a second here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. 
I de, 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 I could, except it's going to want to stream to my personal account rather than to the on one account because I'm not signed in under on one. I don't want to interrupt the presentation too much. Uh, yeah. Maybe I could try another time. Yeah, we'll figure that out later. All right, let me go back to our screen sharing here. All right, so everything's downloaded. There's all the photos. You notice how they're all black and white. When I click on one of these photos, you'll see how it's added my author tag. It's added my keywords that I asked to add as well, and they're obviously all black and white. So it's gone through and done all that work for me all at once. So that's really the best way to get your photos from your device into on one photo raw 2018. All right, the next thing I want to show you is there's a bunch of great browse features that were added kind of along the way to help support this new import dialog. The first one I want to show you is the ability to drag the photos into any order that you want. So there's now a custom sort feature. So I could pick any photo that I want. Let's say that I want to present these to my client via a slideshow and I want to pick which photo is the first photo that they see. So I can select any photo or a selection of photos and then I can just drag them into whatever order I want them to be. So if I want this to be my first photo, I'll just drag it up there. And you notice down here, the sort menu now says custom. That custom order will be remembered over time. I can easily drag them into any order that I want. It's really handy. Also, if you want a batch rename, you could drag them to the order you want and then rename them in that order as well. All right, here's another cool thing that you can do. You can now use what we call auto advance. Auto advance makes it easy as you're going through and doing your culling. If you use either the stars on your keyboard or the colors or the P or the X key to mark your favorites to go through and mark them very quickly. I'm gonna to go to film strip view. That's the view that I like to do my culling in. That way I can kind of see the photos in the neighborhood, but I get a larger view of it. I'm also gonna close this little drawer on the right to give us some more room. Auto advance lives under the photo menu up here and I'll enable auto advance. Now what will happen is, as each time I hit a key, either the number keys for the stars or the color keys or the P, the X or the U keys for the likes, it'll automatically move me to the next photo. So I like this photo. I'm gonna use the five stars, the ones that I like, and one stars for ones I don't like. So I'm gonna hit the five on my keyboard. Bang, oops, sorry. There we go, and did I turn it on? And go three, and five, and three, just like that. And it'll automatically add those tags and increment through those photos just like that. It's a super handy way to go through and do your culling. Another cool thing you can do is you can actually browse and manage your video files now. So if you've downloaded video files, and it will appear in that uh, uh, import dialog as well, you can find video files. Let me show you how you can find them quickly down here in the filter section. So I can go to filters. I can turn it on and under the advanced section, I could search by object type. And under object type, I can search for photos or versions or video files. So I just select video files and it'll automatically find just the video files. And when you see a video file, they're gonna look kind of like this. Where did it go? Somehow I managed to lose track of my video file that I had. I think I had it on another drive that I've, I uh, forgot to plug in. So when you see a video file, you'll see basic metadata on it. You'll see the playtime in the corner of it. And if you double click on it, it'll launch into your default video player and you'll be able to play that video. You can also set up an external editor to send it to whatever application you want to. So let's say you use Premiere or another application for editing video files. You can simply right click on a video file and send it directly to your video editing app. It's a really handy way to keep track of both your photos and your video files. All right, now that edit capture date option that you guys saw, you can also do here inside of browse as well. So let's go find a folder of photos here. Let's say I wanted to go through and either batch rename or change the edit time. The same options that I had in that import dialog, I now have standalone inside of browse. So I could select an entire group of photos in here. I can right click and use the rename files option. And from here, I can have those same renaming options. I can do text, put in a job name. I can add options like a serial number or a date. Let's add the date and I'll use that year, month, day option. If you like time, there's also lots of options in there to segment things based on time. And I could also add a serial number here. 
There we go. So we can batch rename with the date inside of Browse. You also have the option to change the capture date the same way. So if I right click, I can use Edit Capture Date. And here I have those same options of either setting all of them to a specific date, adjusting based on time zone, or using the create date. The option you pick is going to kind of depend on what you do. Uh, oftentimes you'll use the set to create date if you've used some other application that has removed the capture metadata. That can happen, especially if you export photos out of uh, like iPhoto or Apple Photos. It strips out some of that metadata. So this will let you put that metadata back in by using the creation date of a file. Or you could also set everything to a specific date and time as well. All right, let's talk a little bit about metadata templates. I'm going to open up that right-hand drawer over here, and I'm going to add a little bit of metadata, and I'll show you how to create and add a template. So in the metadata section, you can fill out any of this information in the IPTC section, and then store it as a preset. So I'm going to add a couple keywords here. Actually, no, let's do this. I'm going to just put in my contact information. That's a really common thing that you want to apply as a template across all of your photos. So I'm going to set the author and the creator, and I could put in all of my contact information here. And I could also put in information down here in my copyright field as well. Oops. That's awesome, Dan. I wanted to jump in real quick. I've had mm -hmm. a few people uh, mention they are unable to see the bottom of the user interface. And I think that is because either your window is not expanded lo uh, large enough. If you're having trouble seeing what the uh, interface looks like at the bottom because it's being covered up, just go ahead and expand your window. Also, you can use the view options at the very top of your window. If you click view options, uh, tinker with those options to be able to see the entire screen. I'm able to see the entire screen, but my resolution is probably different than yours. So hopefully that helps you, you folks out there that are having problems seeing the bottom of uh, the interface. And I think there's a full screen option that'll make it fill up your entire screen as well. And I think that'll scale it to fit, make it a little easier for you guys to see everything. So once you've filled out some of that contact information, you want to save it as a preset, you'll come right up here to the preset menu and say, save as a preset. I'm just going to call this my contact metadata. And you can then pick which sections of the metadata you want to store. So you could have completed all the metadata on a photo and you only want to use part of that for the preset. You don't want to use the same keywords or the same description on every photo. You only want to copy and paste over the stuff that makes sense to you. So I'm going to come in and say the only part that I want to remember is the IPTC contact and the IPTC copyright metadata. There we go. It'll save that as a preset. Now I can select photos anytime. I'm going to grab all the photos in this folder. I can come up to the preset option, select that, and now it'll add that metadata to all the photos that I had selected. And I can use that here inside of Browse or in that import dialog. All right. Cool. All right. I think that is most of the new stuff in Browse. Do we have any questions before I jump on to our next stuff? I'm sure we do. Let me, <laughs> let me call through a, a few. Okay. Is the star rating shown with the photograph through each of the mo modules? For example, can you see the star ratings if you're in the develop module, Dan? Yeah, exactly. So like if I set this photo to a five star and I take it into develop, you do have to make sure you have the film strip up. So go into film strip view right here, and then you'll see the rating right there. And you can change the rating inside of developer inside of effects as well. So let's say I wanted to add a red color to this. Maybe I've finished editing the photo and I mark them red when I'm done uh, doing my edits on it. I can change that metadata right here inside of a module. Awesome. Next question, and this one comes from Gail. She'd like to know if you originally imported JPEG files and if you can import raw files from like a Nikon, for example. Sure, uh, you can import anything. I happen to have had JPEGs on this memory card, but it will import any kind of file that we support. So it could be from RAW, it could be TIFF, JPEG, it could be video files from any number of video formats. Sure. Does, does Browse overwrite the metadata, Dan? 
Browse, its job is to extract the metadata from the photo. So it will pick up whatever's in the photo, or if there happens to be a sidecar with the photo as well, it will reconcile the data from the photo and the sidecar together. Then as you change and add metadata inside of Browse, oftentimes you'll add metadata that's not in the photo to start with, that data gets stored in the database on your computer. It also gets written to sidecar files that go along with the photo. And that gets written to both an Adobe compatible XMP sidecar file. So if you open that photo into another Adobe application, it will receive that same metadata changes that you make and also to an on one sidecar file. So if you interchange it with other copies of Photo Raw, you'll see those metadata or editing changes there too. Awesome. And last question, um, we, this one comes from Ken. He wants to know if the changes, such as like converting to black and white, for example, if, that, if those changes are permanent or non-destructive. Totally non-destructive. All we're doing is just adding a set of instructions to all those photos. That's why I did it so fast. So I could easily go back to those photos. Those happen to have lived on my desktop here. Here's that folder of her photos. And I could just go up to, hang on, settings and say, reset all settings and now it'll instantly go back to color just like that and I could do that on all of those so I could select all of those and reset all of them to remove that black and white preset that I added to them okay great and just one more question kind of around that Dan so for example when you're importing from your card and as part of the import you use uh, black and white is it also going to bring the color photo in as well so you shot a color photo and a black and white photo in the camera? Is that the question? I think that might be the question, or the question could also be if they're applying a black and white uh, setting upon import using the software. So uh, it'll bring in all the photos that you shot, assuming that you had them all selected in the import dialog. And if you add that preset at the beginning, that uh, preset is being applied to the original color photo, but keep in mind it's all non-destructive. So you could easily, just like we did, just take that setting off of those photos. And I just happened to use black and white as an example, so it would be really obvious that a setting was being applied to the photos. That's not a typical workflow that you would do. A more common workflow would be, I'm shooting at a location and I know there's certain things I wanna do for that location. Or oftentimes, and I'll, we'll talk about tethered shooting here in a minute, I'll shoot one photo with my camera set in a tethered shooting mode and I'll adjust for that given scene, save that setting, and then I can apply it to all the new photos that I shoot. It makes it really fast if you're working in the studio, especially if you're an event photographer. Awesome, that's it for now, Dan. Okay, cool. Let's move on and let's talk about some of the improvements in panorama. So I'm just gonna grab a few panorama photos here for us. I'm gonna grab this bracket of three and I'll send it to panorama. So in the panorama module, we've made some really big improvements. First off, it now supports uh, many more photos and much larger photo output. So you can now do up to, I think it's uh, 40 photos in a panorama. You can also do a better job of detecting vertical panoramas and matrix panoramas. It will detect those and stitch those together without distorting them. We've also done, uh, made some improvements into the blending of skies, especially if the photos were raw to start with and we have all of the information and metadata with those, we can smooth out the patches in the sky better. It's still an area that we're working on and I do recommend that you turn lens correction on before you send your photos into uh, panorama. That'll help get rid of the peripheral distortion as well. You notice the dialogue looks a little bit different couple of the changes in here is you now have the ability to pick the algorithm or the type of panorama that's going to create. By default, it's going to be on automatic. It's going to pick whichever algorithm works the best, but there's an option for a spherical panorama or a collage panorama. Let me kind of explain the difference. A spherical panorama is where the camera is stationary and it might look left or right or up or down. That's the most common scenario. That's the one that you're going to use the most. The collage option is if, let's say, you're shooting in a hallway in a very long hall and you shoot one picture and then you walk three steps and you shoot another picture and you walk three steps and take another picture. So basically the camera is moving along the scene. That's the collage option. And typically the spherical is the one that's going to work the best for most people, but if you shoot a collage, that's the option you'd wanna pick. We've also improved the warping option for automatically correcting the edges. So you can see the photo without any correction, a simple crop, and then if we use the warp option, you can see that some of that area that would have been cropped off, we get back by using the warp to fill option. The other one that I find really handy is the new file size option. So many times, especially with today's uh, really high megapixel cameras, we're creating these ginormous panoramas that are way bigger than what we need. No one's, or I should say no one, but very few people are gonna make 10 foot long prints of their panoramas. So you can use the file size option of 50% rather than 100%, and it makes it much faster to process if I use the 50% option. 
All right, so those are the changes in Panorama. We're having lots of fun with it. It's creating beautiful work. Are there any questions on that before I move on? Yeah, Dan, we got a bunch of good questions. Um, okay. First one comes from Francisco here. He wants to know, can you perform searches with filters, including subfolders? Yes. Are there any panorama questions before I jump out of panorama? We can go back to browse here in a second. No panorama questions that I can find, Michael. Nope, nothing, nice yep. okay. nope, nothing on panel uh, yet. So the question was, can you do searches across folders? And you can as long as the folder is a catalog folder. When a folder is a catalog folder, that means we keep an eye on it. We watch it in the background. We look for new photos that are added, photos that are removed, photos that are changed. And then we also can take all that metadata, store it in our local database that makes it searchable across folders. It also enables you to publish the photos to our mobile app and let's show you create things like smart albums. So let me show you how you would search across folders. So what I would do is come down to the filter section, make sure the search catalog folders option is on. And now this will search across all of the folders rather than just the folder that, are, that I'm in. So, Let's see, I want to find, I'll show you another new feature over here. You can search by time of day now easily. So let's say I'm gonna to go to the option over here and pick time of day. I don't wanna find photos that were shot in the morning. Turn that on again here. There we go, so now I found, I picked afternoon, so it found all the photos that were shot in the afternoon. And if I switch it from afternoon to morning, I'll get a different set of photos. I'm finding just photos in shot in the morning. Let's say I only want to find photos, of photos that were shot in the morning at f2.8. So I can click the add button and I can select another option like aperture and we'll select 2.8 and it'll narrow it down. So these are the photos shot in the morning at f2.8, for example. All right, did that answer the question? I hope. I think so. And I just want to remind everyone, I think there's still a few folks out there that are having some issues viewing the entire screen. If you look at the very top of the window and you see a little green bar up there, that says you're viewing Dan Harlacker's screen. If you click view options next to that, try some of the different view options. I think the, the most, uh, the one you probably want to use the most is the original and then make sure your window is large enough so you can see the entire interface. Apologize about that. We're, we're trying out some new webinar software for this presentation. So I appreciate you bearing with me and Dan back to you. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some of the improvements in HDR now. So let me go and we'll grab a different series of photos and I'm going to send these to HDR. So what are the cool new things in HDR? For me, it's worth the price of admission is that you can now pick which frame is actually used for the de-ghosting. So if you shoot anything that moves like clouds or water, if you uh, have one exposure where you're capturing the highlight details, the water is gonna be uh, less fluid versus one where you're capturing the shadow details or the water is gonna have more motion to it. You can now pick how much motion you want in the water and the clouds. That's done by selecting it down here in the film strip at the bottom. The one that has the orange box around it is the one that the deghosting is gonna come from. So if I grab this photo over here and select it, you'll notice that the water is stopped. We actually had a short enough shutter speed to freeze the motion. Well, I don't really want that. I want the nice smooth flowing water instead. So I'm gonna pick one of the longer ones instead. So now I can pick this frame and I get all the nice motion in the water as well. Now you can still pick which frame is used for the base of the exposure as well. You notice there's a new button at the top that has a little uh, aperture icon in it. You click that one to pick which one you want to have the base exposure from. And that's really just the starting point for how bright the photo is to start. Another couple options in here is there's now a new align option. So in the past, it always automatically aligned. It would assume that you were hand holding it. You don't have the ability to turn that off. So if you were shooting on a tripod, you can turn that option off. That could be handy in the rare cases where maybe the alignment uh, can be confused, night photos with lots of stars where it's difficult to align them. You can turn that auto alignment option off. There we go. Let me just make a couple quick adjustments on here so you can kind of see what it looks like. Some of the other improvements we've made in HDR is it is um, 
Uh, the quality of the alignment is much higher, so the result you get back is a lot crisper. There's sharper detail, there's less noise, especially in the shadow areas. And the defringing has also been improved as well. So when you happen to get green or purple defringing on an edge, that's been reduced quite a bit as well. So I think the results that we're getting out of the HDR and dialog now are way better than before. And what we were getting before was pretty awesome. So you can imagine what it looks like now. So hopefully you guys have had a chance to download that and take a look at it. Now, a lot of the improvements that we talked about there in terms of better noise reduction, better defringing, also finds their way into the overall raw processing engine. The engine that processes all of the raw photos has been enhanced as well. For me, the number one change is actually the quality of the debearing. To get really technical on you, the debearing is the part that takes that raw photo, kind of turns it into a normal red, green, and blue photo. When you do that, most photos are actually being interpolated. Two thirds of the data that makes up the photo has to be made up because we only have basically a black and white version of the photo. So the algorithm that does that is very important to get the optimal quality. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of a comparison here. We just take this photo. This will give you a bit of an idea what the difference is. We zoom in. I'm hoping you'll be able to see this through the screen sharing. Sometimes the screen sharing quality uh, doesn't let you see the difference. So the top is the old version of Photo Raw that we shipped, and the bottom is the new version. You notice that it's much sharper and there's less aliasing. That means you'll see less strange color fringing around the edges of things. So sharper, less color fringing. As a matter of fact, even if you compare it against Lightroom or ACR, you'll see how the results are crisper and have less of that color aliasing in it. So we think that's gonna be a really big difference for you guys when it comes to processing your photos. You're gonna see much sharper details coming out of those. It also has better sharpening, better noise reduction, especially at high ISOs, um, giving you a better ability to control the, basically the size of the noise reduction has been enhanced. And we've also added automatic hot pixel removal so that if you have a photo at a really long shutter speed or you've got an older camera that had hot pixels in it, we'll detect those little red and green Christmas tree light hot pixels and automatically filter them out. That makes the noise reduction look so much better as well. All right, before I move on, we have any questions out there? Yeah, Dan, we have some good questions coming in. Okay. And this one comes from Francisco. It's about catalog folders. He wants to know what the advantages are to cataloging folders. And if you want to talk about if that does anything to the space that's used, or is like, is your space doubled? Sure. So catalog folders, again, are, are basically a watched folder. We just keep an eye on them. So anything that is where you kind of keep your favorites, uh, that's what you would put into a catalog folder. For me, I keep all of my photos in one folder structure and I happen to store it in Dropbox so that it's <coughs> synchronized across all my computers. I just watch that folder. The great thing about a catalog folder is when it comes to browsing them, it's going to be faster. Moving photo to photo, we basically generate a fit screen preview version of that photo. So when it comes to browsing the photos, it's gonna be faster. It also gives you the ability to browse and search across folders. So rather than being stuck in one folder at a time, you can search across multiple folders, kind of like we showed a minute ago. It lets you create smart albums, so basically an album that finds things based on a search criteria. It also lets you publish to our mobile application as well. Now, in terms of the space it takes, the database size is pretty negligible. It doesn't really take up any space. Where the difference is are those previews that are created for your screen. Those do take up space, of course. So what you can do is to come to your preferences, go to your system tab, and you can select where those previews are stored. So you can change the cache location to put it somewhere else. So if you're working on a computer that has a uh, small SSD, you might want to target this to something that has more space, like your server or a RAID storage device to store those. The amount of space it takes up is really dependent on the size of your monitor because we're making those previews to fit your monitor that you're running on. So uh, I think there's a knowledge base article that will go into greater detail about that and how to move and how much space you'll need for those previews. Okay. What other questions do we have? Thanks, Dan. Next question, a camera question. <laughs> Does On One Photo Raw work with the Sony A7III? The A7R3, yes. Yep. All right. And if you have questions about which cameras and which lenses are supported, you can check out the knowledge base on our website that lists all of the new ones. And if you uh, look at the release notes for this build, we'll talk about all the ones that were added. There were about a dozen cameras and probably 50 or 60 new lenses that were added in this release. 
Great. And getting back to some questions I think we may have missed. If you're out there and you have any questions, use the Q&A, not the chat to ask questions so we can make sure we see it. But there were some panel questions earlier that we missed that I want to get back to. And okay. it's kind of around uh, the panel performance. Is it, is it doing a better job, Dan, of, uh, of blending the skies? Yes, uh, especially if the original photos are raw photos, it'll do a better job of blending the sky. It does a better job compensating for differences in exposure and differences in white balance between photos. The other thing I would definitely recommend is you turn lens correction on for your photos. If you don't have that on by default, uh, you can control that up here under the preference menu and under files. Make sure that you have apply lens correction turned on by default. The important thing about that is, especially on a lot of wide-angle lenses, uh, drone cameras, phone cameras, the edges of the photos get darker very quickly. The lens correction profiles help to even that out so that when you take two photos and you put them together, you don't get a dark spot between where the frames will blend together. So turn lens correction on. Uh, and there's actually a really good knowledge base article that talks about kind of the best practices for panorama as well, how to get the best ones by how to set up your camera in a consistent way so it doesn't vary shot to shot and how to make sure you have good overlap between the photos so that the algorithm can do a better job. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting a lot more questions now coming in. Dan mentioned, <laughs> uh, you mentioned the database catalog. So I can use that uh, um, two computers and still have access to the same catalog with all the same settings. Yes, so the key to doing that is making sure that you have your sidecars turned on. That's on by default if you installed a new version. If you have an older version, you'll need to go to that preference menu and turn sidecars on. What sidecars do is it creates a little file that goes with each photo. It stores the metadata and the settings for that photo. If you store that in a shareable location like Dropbox, you make a change on one computer, any other computer that's seeing that photo will see that same change just a couple seconds later. So it's really handy if you work in a work group or if you happen to travel. That way you can just move the photos and their sidecars go along with them and everything stays in sync. It's really good. Great. Any improvements specifically for Fuji compressed RAF files? We're still working on Fuji. Today our Fuji results are pretty darn good. There are some cases where we'll see uh, some odd artifacts. That's an area that we're actively working on right now along with uh, improving the hot pixel reduction on Fuji files as well. So keep an eye out. We'll continue to improve it. Awesome. What about uh, pano, vertical panos versus hor horizontal, Dan? So verticals are now supported fully. It'll automatically detect if it's a vertical pano and create those. Awesome. Lots of good questions coming in. I'm reading them as fast as I can. Back to the browser. <laughs> uh, the filter advanced is not showing up in the options to view file types. Say that one more time. I didn't quite follow. I don't quite follow either. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. Is there a way to increase the effect of the highlight slider if it falls short, Dan? What would you recommend in that situation? So for me, the, the secret highlight slider is the haze slider. And I'll oftentimes use that if I need even more. The other thing to do is the shadow algorithm in Photo Raw is super, super good. It's actually the best shadow slider I've ever seen. So if I'm having a hard time getting the highlights that I want, I'll reduce the exposure down and then bring the shadow slider up. And that'll help as well. So. Uh, Think of it kind of like shooting, uh, kind of like shooting slide film versus shooting color negative film. All right, let's jump in. We'll get some more questions here in a minute. I still have a couple more cool things I want to show you guys here. So let's go back. I'm going to share my screen, and let's talk about soft proofing and tethered shooting. So for soft proofing, let me grab a photo. I'm going to take it into develop. Soft proofing lets you simulate on your screen what a photo is going to look like when you actually print it out. You can access this inside of developer effects from the view menu. So you go up to the view menu and you notice right here, there's an option called enable soft proofing that will automatically turn. Oops. Let me turn my clipping off here. There we go. Let me show you, turn that on and off again. There's without soft preview on and with soft proofing on. So it'll switch over the preview background to white. That'll simulate the white color of the paper. And it will also show you the range of color and the range of light to dark that that printer paper combination is capable of producing. You have some options in here. You can select the rendering intent that's used. Most people are going to use relative color metric, but the perceptual option is there as well. And you can select which profile you want to simulate. Now we'll automatically pick up any profile that you've installed for your printer drivers. Any that you've manually installed, you can go down to the import color profile option and add them to the list as well. So this happens to be simulating a luster paper. Let's say we want to use more of a fine art 
uh, watercolor paper and you'll see how the appearance changes. The paper is now more yellow because that paper has a yellow tint to it and the blacks aren't as strong because it can't produce as deep a black as a resin coated paper as well. From the view menu, you can also enable a gamut warning, which will show you the areas in the photo that can't print exactly like you see it on your screen. So in this case, it's all the blacks. This paper cannot produce as deep a black as what we can see on our screen. So this kind of gives you an idea of what areas you want to adjust. What I would do is create a version of my photo that I'm using for printing. You can name that version, what printer and paper you want to print it on, and then you can, in this mode, make your adjustments to try to compensate for those changes. You might increase the black point to try to put more black ink on the paper to help compensate for that. You can also quickly turn those options on or off. Right down here in the footer, there's a little button for turning soft proof on and off, just like that. All right, the next one I want to show you is the new tethered shooting option. It's located here in Browse. On the left-hand side, about two-thirds of the way down, you see a new pane called tethered shooting. Let me roll it open. Right here, I've got a camera attached via USB to my computer. Let's turn it on, and I'll turn tethered shooting on. It will automatically detect, oops. Hope to have the cable plugged in correctly. Ah. Hmm. Just a second here. There we go. For some reason it was thinking it was an icon when it's a Canon. So it'll pop up. You pick your make up here at the top. I'm shooting a Canon camera. There's a big fire button that'll appear that whenever I press that, it will take a picture. And it will also down here at the bottom show me the most common camera settings, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, the white balance. If I happen to be shooting in automatic mode, it'll show me my exposure compensation. I can even adjust in here those settings. So let's say I want to use a longer shutter speed than a 30th of a second. I can pop it up and pick what shutter speed I need to use. Let's use a 15th of a second. The import settings button, when I press that, lets me control where those photos I capture go. So I can pick where the photos go, and those same options that I see in the import dialog, I can rename them on the fly, add metadata, add photo settings, even change their capture date and time, all as every photo is taken. So let's pick where we're gonna put these guys. I'm just gonna put these onto my desktop as well. There we go. Let's take a picture, see if I can take a bad selfie. Come on. It'll automatically switch over to that folder, and there's that picture that we just captured. Looks like it needs to be a little lighter here. Let's go up to maybe an eighth of a second, and we'll try that again here. There you go, just like that. So that's how tethered shooting works. You can fire it from the camera or you can fire it from inside of the app. Each new photo that you shoot will automatically appear right here in Browse. It's a really great way to work in the studio. All right, some other cool things that we've changed, we've worked on the quality of the preview window. So it's a sharper, more realistic preview of what your photo looks like at all zoom settings, and it will match what you export out much closer than it did in the past. There's tons of other bug fixes that we've added, and there's also uh, a bunch of new cameras and lenses. So that's kind of all the new stuff. Uh, before we jump into questions, let me remind you, it's available now. You can download it from the online website or simply go to your help menu and select check for updates, and it will go out and download that update for you. If you haven't uh, updated yet, you can get it right now. It's a really good sale for $79, or if you're upgrading from a previous version, an even better price, check your email for that. And that's about it. So let's open up, take some more questions. Yeah, feel free. If you have any questions, use the Q&A to ask questions. We're not really monitoring the chat as much, but the Q&A is where you want to submit your questions. We had some questions about the tethered shooting you were just showing, Dan. Mm -hmm. Will this work with the Cam5 remote camera controller? It will, it uses the Canon and Nikon official SDK, so you'll need to have a Canon or Nikon camera attached via USB to your computer in order to control it remotely. Now that said, you can obviously watch any folder you want to, so if you're using a third party controller or a Wi-Fi controller, as it downloads photos to your computer, PhotoRAW will automatically see those new photos as they get captured. Great. We don't have any open questions right now, Dan. Well, someone just popped in. 
how would you move all your Lightroom photos to On One Photo Raw 2018.1? Okay, the best way to do that is to use the Lightroom Migration Assistant. So inside of Lightroom, once you've installed Photo Raw 2018, there's actually a built-in tool for doing this. You'll go to File, Plugin Extras, and there's an option called Migrate to Photo Raw. That will help you to move all of your photos, all of their metadata over, and it will give you, it'll recreate all of the uh, collections that you've created inside of Lightroom as albums inside of Photo Raw, and it gives you the option to create a processed version. So if you've done a bunch of edits to your photos and you want to make sure you have those same edit changes inside of Photo Raw, you can create either a TIFF or PSD or JPEG copy of the photos that'll sit right next to it with those edits rendered to them. Great, and this question comes from Bruce. He wants to know if we have plans to have other cameras added for support, like Olympus, hint, hint. Are we talking about for tethered shooting? Yes. So when it comes to tethered shooting, there has to be a cross-platform API from the manufacturer in order to support it. You'll see that's why like uh, uh, other camera maker or other uh, software makers like Lightroom, only sports Canon and Nikon as well. So we have to have support from the camera manufacturers in order to control their cameras remotely. We can't just make any camera work. All right, great. Lots of good questions coming in, Dan. Back to the tethered shooting. Is wireless tether shooting possible? Uh, I don't believe it would be uh, capable through this uh, pane because the SDK is only support USB at this time. But as I mentioned, if you happen to download to a hot folder using FTP with your Wi-Fi adapter and just look at that folder, the new photos coming in will be automatically recognized. Great. Thanks, Dan. And this question comes from Scott. He's wanting to know if there's some kind of evaluation check with, checklist or guided tour document that walks you through all the new features and capabilities with a few tips to try each. That would be pretty handy. I can help answer that. There are, uh, I think, essentially a video on every single new feature available in 2018.1. There is a user guide that's been updated that includes uh, explanation for each one of the new features as well. Dan, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think those videos, the exposed videos, are probably the best way to go through and look at that new stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can find all that stuff in the On One blog. Great. Any other questions out there, Nathan? Oh, yeah. They keep coming in, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want me to stop. Just let no, me know. No, that's fine. All righty. Next question comes from John. If you do the migration from Lightroom to On One, will you still have everything in Lightroom? Of course, yeah. We don't move anything from Lightroom. Uh, all we're doing is we're basically taking the information and bring it over. Lightroom will still work exactly the same way. It's actually a good way to try out the migration. You can move it and then continue to use Lightroom with no loss of data at all. And for those Aperture users out there, like Dan says, uh, Dan Patrick here, he says, is it the same scenario for if you're using uh, Apple Aperture? If you're using Apple Aperture, it is old enough that we have not built an automated migration path for that. What you want to do in that case is select your photos and use the export option out of Aperture instead. I do think if you go to Scott Davenport's blog, um, I don't know if there's a way to put that URL up on the screen or not, but uh, he actually has a really good article on how to move from Aperture to Photo Raw. Uh, so I've checked out his blog. If you don't know, Scott Davenport is one of our one of our fellow photographers uh, who's been a Photo Raw fan for years. And Bill wants to know if there's a revised tutorial for how to print on one, which includes profiles and soft proofing. Yes. Uh, certainly profiles, I'm not sure if there's, there's probably not one that has printing and soft proofing in the same video. There's a video on soft proofing and a video on printing, so. Cool, what else? Can you import photos including custom settings? Import photos including custom settings. So when we say custom settings, we mean, do we mean edit settings like things from development effects, I assume, is what we're talking about. If the photo has a sidecar file that has settings on it already, the import dialog will honor those and move them along with it as well. How would you, uh, um, Dan, how if you were editing a photo, how would you send it to Facebook? So there's two ways. If you're working on a Mac, it's pretty easy. Let me show you here. Let me go back and share my screen. There we go. Let's say we want to share this wonderful photo to Facebook. There's a share button right here on the Mac. The Mac platform has built-in sharing services to go to a number of different services. I would just select Facebook right here, and it'll automatically bring up the Facebook sheet. It takes a second for it to pop up. Oh. 
And then on the Windows side, there's not a built-in share option at this time. What you would do is you would export a copy of the photo out and then send it to uh, Facebook via your web browser instead. So I could just add this here and drag this little guy out of the way. And we'll say, here is a silly pic of me from the webinar today. And hit the post button. And that'll automatically appear on my Facebook page now. Just like that. All right. Other questions? Yeah, definitely, Dan. If you've got a moment, I've got a bunch of more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Jeff would like to know, when using the import feature, can you uh, copy your images to another drive? Do the settings also get saved to the secondary location? That is a great question, and I believe they do, but I haven't actually tried that. I think it does. What else? I import images into Lightroom and apply a preset for my Fuji images. Can I do this in On One Photo Raw? Uh, that's exactly what we did. So you can create a preset and then apply that on the fly using the settings option. So if we open up the import dialog, right here under photo settings, you can pick any preset that you want. Oops, sorry, it's trying to read from the wrong device here. Right here under photo settings, you can pick any preset that you've created or any preset that you've downloaded. So if you wanted to add a certain look to it on import, you can do that. Okay, what else? Are you going to add lens correction support for fixed lens cameras? It's actually already there. And if you don't see that support for your camera already, we use the uh, LensFun open source project. You can contribute photos from your camera to that project and they'll be added in the next version. This is a good question, Dan, and we get this one a lot. Why can edits and layers not be shared in effects or develop? Uh, well, I guess there's, there's kind of a couple answers to that because it's kind of a complex subject. So when it comes to layers and resize, those are outside of the non-destructive world. So anything that you do inside of develop and effects is all on the raw data, it's all non-destructive. And those changes don't actually happen to the photo until you actually export out a copy of them. Whenever you go to layers or resize, it has to create a rendered version of that photo. So any adjustments you've applied to that photo up to that point will be rendered and then they will be sent to layers. Now, once you're in layers, you can always turn a photo into a smart layer, which then allows you to have non-destructive settings on a layer by layer basis as well. So you kind of get the best of both worlds by using that smart layer technology. Awesome, thanks Dan. And one last question from Arnold. When you're moving from Lightroom to On One, will the sidecar from Lightroom be entered into On One when you import them? So if you use the migration assistant, it's not necessary. We actually have a direct communication between Lightroom and our database. So the sidecar isn't necessary for that. We'd actually move the data across without the sidecar, but it would have the same data that was in the sidecar file from Lightroom. So. Awesome. You can go ahead and continue on, Dan. Keep okay. asking questions if you have that was one. actually That was actually everything. That was kind of all the new features. I think we covered them. So okay. if there's no other, um, other questions, I think we're done. We still got a few here. Okay. I want to make sure everyone gets their questions answered. Can you talk a little bit about how um, On One integrates with the Wacom pen tool and being able to uh, use it to adjust sure. and size? Um, I wish I, I didn't have one uh, at this table here to kind of show you exactly how it works, but I can reference how it works here. So when you are inside of any of the modules that use a brush tool like develop or effects, I'll just take a photo into effects here. When you add a filter, let's just stick a black and white on here to make it really obvious. If I use any of the brush tools like the masking brush, if you click on the little gear right up here at the top, you have the option to adjust the size with pressure or the opacity with pressure or both. So that means that as you press down with a pressure sensitive tablet, like a Wacom tablet, it'll make the brush bigger or smaller and or it will change the opacity. It'll paint very soft to very strong. A lot of times when I do it, I'll actually turn both of those options on and then it gives you a very natural media feel. You brush small and you get a very small, very light brush stroke and the harder you press, the bigger, stronger brush stroke it creates. Awesome. Okay. What else? 
And can you migrate from Lightroom a second time, Dan? You can migrate as many times as you want to. It's not a fast process. So it's not one I recommend that you use as a way to interchange data continuously. But if you do it once, you perform a test on it, and then later on you want to do it, you can do it again. The other thing is because Lightroom has a catalog-based concept, you may have multiple catalogs. You want to migrate all those catalogs. You open catalog A, migrate that one, open catalog B, migrate that one. What else? Does on one have to be open when you migrate? It does have to be open when it migrates, yes. Okay. And it'll automatically launch it if it's not. So if you select that option, it's not open, it'll launch it. And I think we covered this question before. Last question from Jeff, but uh, can you make a secondary copy to another drive during your import? Mm -hmm. And what happens to the NDEs? Do they get saved in both locations? You can definitely copy to a secondary location for backup, and when it comes to the non-destructive settings, so if you've applied a preset during import, I want to say that it gets migrated to the uh, secondary location as well. That's one I've never actually tried myself, so I'd have to actually try it to be sure. Awesome. I think that's all the questions, Dan. All right. Well, cool. I thank everybody for coming today. We're really excited about this release. It's a ton of new features in a pretty short time frame from when we ship. I want to kind of reiterate our commitment to consistently and constantly add new features and improve our product. If you're unaware of the Photo Raw project, if you go to our website, you can actually see the features that we're currently working on. You can add new features that you will work on and vote on the features that are important to you. And that directly drives what gets added to the next version of the product. So in a few more months, you'll have another release with more great stuff to see. So. Uh, really happy you guys joined us. Again, today's webinar was recorded. If you have any questions, you can uh, watch that again. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.